Hey man, it's me, Kevin Smith, the annoying voice of podcasting. And you're listening to the non-annoying Three Guys in a Flick. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The show is about to begin. I admit we knew we'd get in trouble. That part's true. We knew people would be worried and we still ran away anyway. But something also happened, which we didn't do on purpose. When we first met each other, something happened to us. Welcome back. You are listening to Three Guys in a Flick. This is where we review the good, the bad, and the absurd. Tonight's episode, Moonrise Kingdom. Beware spoilers. Coming to you from Mile 3.25 Tidal Inlet, my name is Don. And to my right, we have the comic book guy, John. Jiminy Cricket, he flew the coop. And to my left, we have the professor, Ken. Hello, everybody. How you guys doing? I'm doing pretty good. How you doing? Nah, I can't complain. Yes, you can. You do every single show. I do. I don't. Every com- single show you complain. No, I don't. I don't know what you're talking about. I, myself, am doing quite well tonight. Why is that, uh, comic book guy? Because it's a lovely podcast evening. Oh, that's weird. That doesn't sound like him, does it? Uh-uh. Tonight, we are talking about Moonrise Kingdom. This movie was submitted to us by one of our listeners, Gabe. Uh, thank you so much for the suggestion, and we are excited to talk about it. Have you guys, have either of you seen this before? I had, yes, I had seen this before. What about you, John? This was my first time seeing this movie, and I'm so happy that we got to watch another puppy snuff film. Well, I mean, I, I guess I can see where you're coming from because they do accidentally kill a dog. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't call it a puppy snuff film. That's a bit harsh. I'm just wondering what does Wes Anderson have against dogs in his movie? Um, well, that's a good question because you know, uh, throughout his movies, there are some references to the canine. Well, I guess Buckley, I've never seen the Royal Tenenbaums, Tenenbaums, but Buckley gets run over, uh, in life aquatic, the three-legged dog gets hit with a newspaper in, I guess, Mr. Fo- the Fantastic Mr. Fox. The beagles are drugged with blueberries. Beagles uh, love blueberries. And in this movie, Snoopy gets shot with an arrow. Yeah, okay, I, but- I, I forgot that it happened. What about I Love Dogs? The they- whole story is revolving around puppies. And how they champion themselves. Yeah, but isn't the whole movie start off with them getting rid of the dogs because they're killing people or something, the virus or something? Uh, it's been a minute since I've seen it. That's, uh, I'm going to have to go back and watch it because I remember enjoying it, I think. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a quirky watch. Yeah, well, he's a kind of a quirky director. Uh, one thing I did actually read is one of the reasons why he incorporates uh, things happening to animals or happening specifically to dogs in it is because it's a way of him making it feel real like there is real uh penalties or fatalities like life is real in his movies so he wants to show some form of life and death in each of his movies there you go released on may 25th 2012 moonrise kingdom was directed by wes anderson it was written by wes anderson and roman coppola and it stars bruce willis edward norton bill murray francis mcdormand Tilda Swinton, Jason Schwartzman, Bob Babelban, and a bunch of other actors. How'd this movie do, Don? Uh, this had a budget of $16 million and it brought in $68 million. So this isn't the first movie we've reviewed from Wes Anderson, and we know that he is a very stylized director. Let's talk a little bit about him being a, a quirky director, because I think that he's a really interesting director. The opening scene, for example, you know, the, where the camera's on rails and we move along and that, that left to right progression seems to be a signature move for him. And and in that, you'll also get the uh, the pan shot, you know, where the camera swivels 
And I think that that is something that is extremely pronounced. He has a couple other uh, features as well. He's really into his symmetry, and he uh, likes his slow motion walking shots. Uh, he's also proficient at something called knolling. Have either one of you ever heard of this before? Mm-hmm. I have not. Knolling is when you are paying attention to the right angles of things. And when you can, you're hoping to emphasize it. So you scan your environment and you're looking for materials or tools, books, music, whatever it is. And then you pay attention to all of that. And then you put everything not in use out of the picture and you leave it out. Everything else, you group all of the objects together. And then you align or square all of the objects to either the surface that they're resting on or onto the studio itself. And that is definitely something that he pays a lot of attention to. Yeah, and you can definitely see it. For me, this being the second Wes Anderson movie I think I've ever watched, I'm starting to actually get a little bit of an appreciation for his style. I will say I'm still not a fan of the dialogue, the monotone, kind of non-emotional, especially making everyone feel like they're 30, 40 years older than they actually are. Uh, it kind of puts me to sleep a little bit. So that is my really my only complaint. What I did appreciate, like in Life Aquatic, how everything kind of felt like almost like a Jack Cousteau type documentary. This movie had a big focus on painting, on watercolors, on things like that. And how even the movie opens feels like you're looking at a painting. And one of the uh, interviews I was reading with Wes Anderson talked about how when you look at paintings, you always think that, you know, they must have like a perfect life. Like it's Norman Rockwell, everything's perfect. But now we're getting a glimpse at what possibly is happening within the painting that things aren't as perfect as we see. Yeah. Yeah. And speaking of painting, that is certainly another strong point about Wes Anderson. He is very much into his limited color palette of things. Mm -hmm. Right. He, he really does love yellow. Yes. That is for sure. So, yeah, definitely uh, a, a Wes Anderson movie. He wrote this along with Roman Coppola. Do you guys know who Roman Coppola is? You know, I was trying to figure out who he is, and I saw that he's had a couple other Wes Anderson writing credits as well. But I was wondering, is he related to a more well-known Coppola? Yeah, that's his son. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, Francis Ford Coppola's son. Um, yeah, I... I understand what you're saying about the deadpan delivery and kind of the monotone uh, tones throughout Wes Anderson's films. Um, but I think that the dialogue, at least for me, is is sharp enough and witty enough that it breaks it up. And, and I appreciate it. Agreed. Uh, it, for me, it crackles. Yeah, I think he's a great writer. And we said this on the Life Aquatic. I mean, Wes Anderson is not for everybody, mm-hmm. right? Uh But I'm glad that you have a new appreciation, and I can confidently tell you that if you somewhat like this or enjoyed it uh, more than uh, Life Aquatic, whatever, I think that you will like the Fantastic Mr. Fox. I think you will dig that. Uh, I think you will like the Grand Budapest Hotel, and even uh, you should check out the Isle of Dogs because you love dogs so much. This movie does top a lot of lists for uh, people's favorite Wes Anderson uh, I know that Rushmore is a big one, and the Tenenbaums, mm-hmm. and even Bottle Rocket. Bottle Rocket's a really good film, too, his first one. Mm-hmm. So, what about this cast? What a star-studded cast. Absolutely. Holy moly. Minus the two main characters. Did you hear how they got Susie and Sam? Uh, I think it was like, uh, weren't they just random? He went around, and he did auditions at, I guess, four different schools, until he just found... You know, two random kids that just really came across to them. And and Wes Anderson said for Sam, it wasn't so much his audition, but it was him talking to the casting director afterwards that kind of nailed him mm-hmm. the role. So that's awesome. Yep. I thought they did great. For two kids who have never acted, I fucking believed them. And if you go and look at their acting credits since that movie, they've both gone on to, done, to do several more things. Yeah, good for them. They both kept really busy. Good for them. Good for them. But um, you, we have our kind of staples in a Wes Anderson movie. You have Bill Murray, Francis McDormand, and Jason Schwartzman. Edward Norton, Tilda Swinson, uh, Bob Babylon. Yeah. Bruce Willis is the newcomer, and I think he fit right in. I really totally. enjoyed him as that character. I fucking totally. believed it, and I was in love with Bruce Willis again. You know who I really appreciated in this movie was Edward Norton. He always comes across as kind of a gruff, unpredictable guy like Fight Club or 
uh, you know, these other type movies. But in this movie, he comes across as just, you know, the Jiminy Cricket guy who's always positive. And, you know, I thought it was nice to see both him and Bruce Willis playing different characters than they normally cast as. I am not a huge Ed, Edward Norton fan um, by any stretch of the imagination, but I did enjoy him in this role. I thought he did really well. It was his most pleasant role that I can think of seeing him in. Yeah, yeah. How many movies up till this point, up to this movie, had Bill Murray been of Wes Anderson movies? A billion. According to my notes, this will make his sixth Wes Anderson movie when he made Moonrise Kingdom. Another thing I appreciate about maybe Wes Anderson in this movie is he kind of allowed the kids to be kids and to present themselves that way. Like, uh, I believe her name is Kara Haywood, who played Susie. Uh, her makeup always looked kind of weird and like overdone, but he actually let her do it as a 12-year-old would do their makeup. Yeah. yeah. That's sweet. Yeah. Uh, I thought that the kids, uh, it felt very childlike and there was a, uh, a child heart at the center of the story. So yeah, it was good. So this is a coming of age movie. Do you guys have a, a, a another coming of age movie that you guys dig? We have reviewed three coming of age movies. What, Pe are, what are those three? Peanut Butter Falcon. I wouldn't call that a coming-of-age movie necessarily. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, John Wick Chapter 3. Yes, that's one. Okay. Uh, Ghostbusters. Yes, that's two. Well, the new Ghostbusters. The new Ghostbusters. Do no. Yeah, ha, 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 fucker. Blues Brothers? No. Come on. Blues Brothers wasn't a coming-of-age film? Wait a minute. Tommy Boy, because he just got out of college. We didn't do... Oh, I guess we did do Tommy Boy. <laughs> All right, genius professor, hit us. Big. Okay, one. Breakfast Club. Okay, two. Book Smart. Oh, fuck me. Yeah, he's he's right. Out of those, I think I would, depending on my mood, it would either be Breakfast Club or Book Smart. Okay. So, so do you guys... But overall, a coming-of-age movie? Yeah, you like coming-of-age movies? I don't mind them. I mean, if the story's good and, the, and, the, and there's a heart to it, because I think coming-of-age movies, there should be some sort of heart to it. One interesting thing you bring up about the coming-of-age to age, age movies, uh, I guess when coming up with this idea, Wes Anderson mentioned he's always wanted to do you know, a teen romance-type movie. And the way that this movie was stylized was almost to be, almost to be like a teen fantasy of how they see, you know, relationships and how they, you know, would have for their fantasy romantic, you know, swept away off on a, you know, runaway type thing. Uh, I think in this movie, the children acted like adults and the adults acted like children. So, That's yeah, kind of, sort of. So, John, you don't have a coming of age movie necessarily that you dig? I can't think of one except for maybe like E.T. There you go. What's yours? I think if we were to do another coming of age, I'd want to do Stand By Me. Oh, great flick. Yeah. Wait, we haven't done Stand By Me? Mm -mm. Oh. No, but we did Tommy Boy. <laughs> Thanks, bud. So in doing my research for this movie, I came up with a few more trivia questions for you guys. The books that Susie read throughout the movie, were any of them real books? No, they were all done by uh, members of the uh, production team. Absolutely correct. What was the last scene in the movie that was filmed and why? I answered the last one. You go. Uh, it was the dancing scene on the beach. They uh, they wanted to do that because the two character the two actors would be comfortable and familiar with each other, and so it was a closed set. And they just had uh, like the cameraman and Wes Anderson and the actors, and it was just a couple of people, so that way they'd feel more comfortable dancing. And it was handheld, and it yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. And I thought that was the perfect way to do it because, yes, they actually did look comfortable with each other. Uh, in According to the original script, how did Sam's parents die? Car accident. Professor, you got a guess? Uh, no. Boating accident. They were killed by a drunk driver, so you're closest with car accident. How, how is that any different? How come I don't get well, I'm closest? How come it's just not the right answer? Because maybe they were run over by a drunk driver. I don't know. Right, you don't know. So the answer is correct, and I want you to fucking acknowledge it. The answer is correct. Yeah, boy! <laughs> and my last question for you. When Sam is surrounded by the scouts in the lightning field, oh, yeah. he says, on this spot, I will fight no more forever. Who does that come from? It comes from the Native American uh, 
is it Chief Joseph? Chief Joseph. Excellent. Uh, so much better than what I was going to say. In 1877, Chief, Chief Joseph attempted to lead his people on an 1,100-mile journey to Canada to try to escape the U.S. Army. They made it within 40 miles before they were completely surrounded, and cho- Chief Joseph made that exact same speech. This movie was nominated for Best Original Screenplay. I'm surprised it didn't win any awards. Soundtrack. What did you guys think of the soundtrack? It really fit the movie, I thought. Yeah, it was. It felt very Wes Anderson. Mm-hmm. I felt a lot of inspiration from uh, what he, had, what his previous project was, uh, Mr. Fox. You know, kind of the pacing oh, okay. and the and the tunes and the way it moved. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I dug it. Uh, Wes Anderson um, is pretty solid with his soundtracks. <clears throat> I do have one question for you guys, and it's something I couldn't figure out. There is a lot of references to corn in this movie. Is there some symbolism I am missing? Because I guess Wes Anderson is really big into symbolism. What is with the corn? I don't know. Do I even have to say it? Do you guys know what I'm going to say? No, who cares? Yeah. Well, I mean, just it seems like it's really obviously put in there. The Scoutmaster is reading Indian Corn Magazine. Sam smokes from a corn cob pipe. The three bishop boys are eating corn on a cob in one, one dinner scene. Uh, I mean, it's just all over the place. And in the end, they talk about how the storm created the best corn crop the island has had in 50 years. So it just kept popping up over and over again. I didn't know if that was some Popping. Kind of, I didn't know if that had some kind of like symbolism in this movie. Well, he does like his yellow, as somebody was saying. Yeah, well, no. Um, if anyone was going to have the answer, I fucking thought it would have been you. So... So anyway, listeners, if anybody knows what the deal is with corn, please put it in the comments. On the New England island of New Penzance, 12-year-old orphan Sam Shikusky attends Camp Ivanhoe, a khaki scout summer camp led by Scoutmaster Randy Ward. Susie Bishop, also 12, lives on the island with her parents Walt and Laura, both lawyers, and her three younger brothers in a house called Summer's End. Sam and Susie, both introverted, intelligent, and mature for their age, meet in the summer of 1964 during a church performance of Noi Flute and become pen pals. The relationship becomes romantic over the course of their correspondence, and they make a secret pact to reunite and run away together. In September of 1965, they execute their plan. Sam escapes from Camp Ivanhoe while Susie runs away from Summer's End. The pair rendezvous hike, camp, and fish in the wilderness with the goal of reaching a specific location. So this movie opens up in typical Wes Anderson style, and I can't believe it took me this long to kind of put this together or for this thought to come into my head, but even like with The Life Aquatic and all of his other movies, the way we move the camera, the way we track left to right, go up and down, and we can see, it's like we're in a dollhouse. Yeah, and that's that's uh, not a dissimilar thing that people look at his work and, are you looking at a dollhouse? And it, sometimes it is because he, he likes working with miniatures because he did a lot with Life Aquatic. Yep. But yeah, you look at some of these shots, especially at the house at the beginning, it looks like a dollhouse, but here comes, you know, one of the little ones up the stairs. Yeah, there's so much detail. You know what I mean? So uh, instantly I'm already uh, mesmerized by what's going on on screen. One thing I also read about this movie is it's supposed to appear or feel like when Susie reads from her books, one of her fantasy books. Did you get that kind of impression from the way that the story was going? No, not really. Uh uh-uh. uh. Okay. This is how we meet the Bishop family is through the is through the different scenes of the house. And we get what at least three different shots of Susie with her binoculars. And then we're introduced to the island by the narrator. What do you think of the narrator? Uh, he was fine. Uh, he definitely fit. He's another one that was in a lot of Wes Anderson yep. films too. Yep. Uh, he he fit what was going on. Uh, he he was a he was a good puzzle piece to this whole puzzle. He made me kind of feel like like every time he was shown, we were going back to kind of that life aquatic documentary like maybe he was just making a documentary on storms and so they were switching back to him every so often to talk about this island Hmm. i just took it that he was uh, helping us propel the story along because it it ends with him talking about this big storm that's coming in three days time right and then from there we are introduced to camp ivanhoe 
And I like this scene. Uh, again, we have our long tracking shot, but we get what I would assume is like the daily routine. You know what? Uh, uh, Edward Norton gets up. It's so funny watching this. I know. And uh, the first thing he does is lights a cigarette. And then he kind of goes through when we're introduced to the characters and their jobs and he, how he it goes on. gets outside the tent, his, his uh, kerchief, you know, his scarf, it's being ironed by one of the kids. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> and he puts it on and they start walking. Yeah. Uh, I really enjoyed this scene. I thought it was good. And then he ends up. Latrine. Uh, let's see that latrine work. Yeah. That was good. And then after that, where do you go after that? Uh, to the cook, didn't he? Didn't he go sit down and have some breakfast? Well, no, but he had several stops along the way. The firework, the guy with the fireworks, the one with the treehouse way up in the air. Oh, oh, the tr- oh. It's too tall. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it, it was the uh, the ants. And so he oh, stops. Yes. What are you doing with that? Because he's got the open flames and he's right. got and he's got the fuel. And then he doesn't talk anything about that. It's you're out of uniform. Your shirt's untucked, and you know, write him. And he's We're writing you up for uh, uniform. Right. Yeah. One of the things I guess they were going for in this is they were trying to show that each one of these scouts has some kind of issue or mental condition or something wrong with them. And even though they treat Sam as the outcast, he seems throughout the whole movie to be the best of the scouts. Cool. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I never, I never once thought any of them had any type of. Not even the guy Not killing one. ants with gasoline, or no, he's no. fucking. Tw- you've never killed ants with gasoline. Not well, gasoline. Twelve years old. You've never had the magnifying glass, crispium. Okay, maybe a magnifying glass, but I was never allowed to play with a big thing of gasoline well, or build a treehouse that was what hundred feet in the air. Okay, you you, you got to know when exaggeration exists, okay. and you just have to go with it. Because first of all, that treehouse couldn't exist. Physically, the physics won't work. It's like uh, Scoutmaster said, it's too wobbly. It's not structural. The whole bit about, you know, when, you know, they're making fireworks, they need to make more, go get more, gun go powder. get more, more gunpowder. Yeah, go yeah. get more gunpowder. And when you also have to remember, this is 1965. Yeah, totally. So, I mean. Kids were tougher back then. Absolutely. Fuck yes, they were. Well, maybe. And then we meet Captain Sharp because he is being notified of a runaway. Oh, we have to notice that he's gone first though, right? Yeah. 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 Well, they notice that uh, when they sit down at the table, someone's missing. Yeah. Who's goes, missing? Who's missing? And they go, Sam. That's right. Sam. And then they go to his tent. And then I think because we're like five minutes into this movie, 10 minutes into the movie, I think it really hooks me here. Cause when Edward Norton, they are searching the tent and he goes up, and there's that poster. And I said, I swear to God, if there's a hole there and it's Shawshank, I'm fucking in. That was our first movie. Re- uh, the fucking awesome. Yeah. So good. I love that scene. I loved his little tool that he whipped out that, to get the zipper up. Yeah. Um, uh, it has the emblem. It's a pocket knife, right? Yeah. It's a scoutmaster, a khaki scout mm-hmm. uh, knife, which he gets taken away later. Yep. But earns it back. And I thought it was interesting, too, that we kind of get the impression that Sam, you know, is is older than his actual age. He's more mature by not just saying he's running away or whatever, that he's resigning from the khaki scouts. Yeah. And this all kind of comes back to the dialogue. Even when uh, we get introduced to Sharp and it's Bruce Willis and their dialogue that goes back and forth, when they notify his foster parents, uh, what does they what do they say? We can't invite him back. Yeah, we can't invite him back. So I mean, all of the dialogue just kind of fit with what was going on. It which was is great. Fun, which is funny because they even say we can't invite him back before they find out he ran away. That's right. Because <laughs> uh, Sharp's like, wait a minute, what do you mean you're not inviting him back? He just he can't understand what's going on. And the interesting thing I thought is everyone uses the same phrase when talking about him that he's emotionally disturbed yeah. they say it throughout the whole movie it's like everybody knows this or everybody's heard this that he is emotionally disturbed yeah well that's what that's how people were labeled when they were just misunderstood or out of the norm mm-hmm. right and especially in 1965 um i don't think that kid was mentally disturbed whatsoever i think she might have been a little bit but that's a different story also, we get to see that the uh, the side by side, you know, you have this drab blue, where we have Captain Sharp, and then we have the foster parents in that brightly lit yellow backdrop on the other side. Right. Such a stark contrast. Yeah. Because right after this, we go back to Scoutmaster Ward, and he's gathering uh, the scouts together, and they're going to do a search party, and then this is where they talk about, you know. Um, you will not hurt him. You will, you know, and he's really laying into them and he's like, 
And then the scouts are like, well, I'm, I'm not going out there without a weapon. Are you going out without a weapon? I'm not going to go out without a weapon. And then you see that baseball bat. With, with all those nails. With all those nails sticking out of it. And then you have the other kid, you know, with, with, the, with it's bigger than a hatchet. It might be an ax on his back. Right. Then we see Captain Sharp. He goes around with the pictures. And then we finally end up at Summer's End where we get to have um, the exchange happening at, you know, between uh, Mr. and Mrs. Bishop and Captain Sharp. And then right after that, then Captain Sharp Mm -hmm. stops at the bench and then Mrs. Bishop comes out. And then we have, we have Susie seeing them through the binoculars. Yeah. With that great shot of her standing on the lighthouse. And so we get the impression that, you know, something's going on between Sharp and, uh, Mrs. Bishop. Which is also seems to be a common theme in Wes Anderson movies is there's always like either a couple on the verge of divorce, getting divorced, been divorced, as well as infidelity or something else going on in all his movies. It might have been through his past life. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So it's not, it's not uncommon in this world. That's for sure. And then after this, then we get Sam. We we see Sam out on his own, where he's out in the canoe, and then eventually he beaches the canoe and he hides it and he starts walking through the woods, and then he stops, and then we look across and we see Susie. And then does it go to the church scene? Well, then it flashes back one year, right? Mm-hmm. To, so yes, to how they meet. Yes, an interesting thing in the church scene that I noticed was uh, that all of the other children in that that Noah's Ark play all had a partner. I like, you know, it was always two by two kind of thing, except when you get to Susie, when they go through, you know, and he starts talking to the girls, uh, dresses the birds. And he says, I want to talk to you. Do you notice that she was the only Raven? No. And that's why one of the reasons why she stood out. She was an, the only individual. Yeah. The way it looked, the way he shot it, she was clearly in the middle. Mm-hmm. Right. And then everyone on the side had the same, kind of uh, costume. And she was in a dark costume. Everybody else was in a lighter costume. Right. And when they showed her in the actual musical and lift her up in the center, you notice that she was the only one in that black costume compared to everybody else around her all had the equals. Right. Uh, The other thing I noticed too was, and you know, of course I've always got to bring it up, but this was foreshadowing that musical. Did you catch that? Because of the hurricane that was coming? The hurricane and the flood and everything that was coming. Sure. And then we get uh, more of their plan to meet, right? We get to go through their correspondence and I their like pen that. pals back and forth. And it's quick, witty dialogue. It was snappy. Yeah. I liked it because we didn't need to hear everything that was in their letters. We just needed to hear the small details and we could fill in the blanks. Wait, wait, hang on, hang on. Was he just happy with less backstory? That's, Is that what he just said? That's weird. I'm saying the communication. No, the, I, the I, I understand what you said. What I'm saying is... Did we just hear him say he liked less backstory? Somebody who invents and concocts and creates endless backstories to plot points. Professor, we are fucking winning. We're going to win him over to the Wes Anderson side. Look at this guy. He's 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 evolving like a fucking uh, butterfly. I thought you were going to say I'm maturing and growing up. Uh, <laughs> I am so proud of you. Uh, no, yeah, it, it was great. Uh, he, here's my plan. Cut to I'm in. Cut to... Where? Cut to when? Cut to bam, here we are. Meanwhile, the khaki scouts have become aware of Sam's absence, finding a letter he left behind stating he has resigned. Scoutmaster Ward tells the khaki scouts to use their skills to set up a search party and find Sam. Police Captain Duffy Sharp and Ward contact Sam's guardians, the Billingsleys, learning they are actually his foster parents and Sam is an orphan with a history of behavioral issues at home. Eventually, a group of khaki scouts confront Sam and Susie and try to capture them. During the resulting altercation, Susie injures the scout de facto leader Redford with a pair of scissors, and a stray arrow fired by one of the scouts kills Camp Ivanhoe's dog Snoopy. The scouts flee, and Sam and Susie hike to mile 3.25 Tidal Inlet, which they name Moonrise Kingdom. They set up camp, and as the romantic tension begins to grow, They dance on the beach and share each other's first kiss. Now, one of the interesting things I thought was, uh, you know, like as we mentioned, there's a bunch of different movie references throughout this movie. Uh, There's a reference where when 
the Scoutmasters putting together the first party. Uh, did you get the reference when they, someone asked him, what is your profession? Oh, no, but what's the reference? He said mathematics. I guess that is a reference to Saving Private Ryan when they have that discussion you know, along the way to find Ryan. Oh, okay. uh, you know, What is your profession? And he doesn't mention it first, but later he reveals that he's a teacher. That's right. That's right. But then I like his response to it. Uh, I'm a scoutmaster first, and then I'm a math teacher second, which is funny. <clears throat> okay, so during this time, they end up catching a fish, and I thought that that was really fun to watch. And then they end up cooking it, and that looked pretty good. And then afterwards, they decide to take inventory. And then after the, <laughs> the stuff that she had with her, all the cat food, right? And then I thought the suitcase would be full of clothes. No. Books. Books. Yeah, stolen books. From the library. Yeah, <clears throat> that was good. Uh, they made it look like he knew how to camp. Yeah, he, that's what I'm saying. He was the probably the best of the scouts. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I don't know. That's hard to say. You didn't get to see all the other scouts perform, you know. So since he's the only one seen, we see using these skills, yeah, it's easy to say that he's the best. One of the things I guess we were supposed to notice throughout this movie is how Sam is maturing and letting go of things, whereas uh, Susie, as she matures, starts to hold on to things tighter. Uh, Sam, if in this early scenes, you notice he's wearing his life preserver every time he goes near water. He's also his... His uh, whole khaki scout uniform is immaculate. He's always got it perfectly done and nothing is out of place. As the movie goes on, he loses the life preserver. He's no longer afraid of the water. In fact, jumping in scene that we get later on kind of shows that as well as we see him without the uniform. Yeah. And then at, it's at this point, it's revealed to the audience that Susie is now missing the family uh, realizes that she's missing and uh, Lionel, the little brother, he shares the, the note that was given to him about how she's borrowing the record player for 10 days. And I'll replace the batteries when I get back. But this is what I thought was interesting is she's running away with Sam, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. Mm -hmm. Did she expect to come back in 10 days? Obviously. So it wasn't that she was thinking it was a permanent thing. Well, she probably was just going along with it. Who so. knows? So that's what I thought was kind of an interesting thing is that I'm thinking they're supposed to be running away together, but she told him 10 days. Yeah, well, maybe she thought that they would only be gone for 10 days. Yeah. Again, they're, they are only 12. So, mm -hmm. you know. I guess I mean. later on, Sam did say when he's talking to Sharp that they expected to get caught. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I like the bit where uh, Mrs. Bishop uses the megaphone to find out where Mr. Bishop is. Yeah. And um, What you was know, that inspired Bill, by? The megaphone? Yeah. Uh, lean on me. No, that was from Coppola's actual life. That's what his mother used to do. Oh, really? Walk around the house with a megaphone. A big Italian family like that? I, it makes sense. That's <laughs> funny. Uh, I like how Bill Murray says, why are you cursing at me? <laughs> I thought their dynamic together was really good. The first scene with them, you know, her yelling out the window with the megaphone and him upstairs, you could almost tell the way that he responded, you know, how you know? How do you feel about your daughter running away? I feel like that's entrapment or something. What does he say? I mean, it's just like a lawyer response. You could right away tell they were both lawyers. Yeah, he says, "I feel like that's a trick question or something like that." Yeah. So then we get uh, we get Captain Sharp showing up, and then uh, we have uh, we have Mister Bishop and Captain Sharp. They're riding in the police car, and then Captain Sharp he lets it slip. How's Laura? Yeah. What do you mean, Laura? And then from there, we, uh, we, that's where we get a little catch-up and we get all of the correspondence letters. And then now everybody's converging on where they rendezvoused and all the scouts are there and everybody is looking around for clues. And Sharp says, until help gets here, I'm deputizing the little one, the eye patch, this kid, lazy and this eye. guy. Lazy eye. Yeah. Which I thought was funny. They call him lazy eye, but he's got a patch over his eye. No, he, he says the kid with the patch. Oh, I thought, well, then who was Lazy Eye? Uh, and then their kid, obviously. Oh, I thought it was the oh, kid no. with the patch. No, the kid with the patch is Lazy Eye. Oh, okay. Well, he does say the kid with the patch. Yeah. He says the kid with the patch on his eye. So do you know why they do that? Why they do what? Deputize or put the patch no, on the, the eye? the patch on the eye for for Lazy Eye. Oh. Why? So your, your dominant eye, the strong eye, is covered up in order to have the 
the the the passive or the not as strong eye work harder because it's not getting any information from the dominant eye. See, that's so funny. I thought he got hit in the eye with an arrow or something. I thought it was an injury. So they go looking. And eventually they are hot on the trail of Sam and Susie. And this is where they have their confrontation. Mm-hmm. Uh, what did you guys think of this whole bit? I dug it. I did too. I thought they were so, I thought all of those kids played that so well. It was. Uh, felt Lord of the Flies. It did. I felt like I was in, I've been in situations like that and when I was 12. You know, uh, the neighborhood kids and um, the square off or whatever. But yeah, it, I really enjoyed that scene. One interesting thing I thought was Susie stabs Red Redford, Redford, Redford with the left-handed scissors. But did you notice she used her right hand to stab him? Wait, did you really notice that? I read it. Yeah. Well, I got an, I got another question for you. You're the one who always kind of points out goofs in movies. Now, how is that a goof? Because she had said earlier she was left-handed. So what? She can't use her right hand ever. Not to stab people. How Murderers do you, always do, use their favorite. How do hand. you know that? I'm not going to talk about it. So I, I really dug how when, when the clash finally happens, they, they're screaming at each other and they're, and they're racing towards each other. And then it's, it's a, a shot of the woods and then it's a scream off in the distance. And then we see all the scouts come flooding over the hill. Running back because they're all scared. And yeah. Yeah, yeah, Do you know why Sam and Susie won? Uh, because they're the protagonists of the story and they have to win? No, because they had the high ground. Oh, for fuck's sakes. And then the very next shot is is the bike in the tree. It's like, how the hell did that end up there? Yeah. And, I mean, this comes to what John refers to as uh, puppy snuff, but they killed fucking Snoopy. Yeah, that was harsh. Assholes. You know why, I, you know why it didn't bother me too much? Because it looked like a fucking puppet. Yeah. So I think that has a lot to do with it. If you take a gorgeous-looking little puppy like John Wick and you look into his big brown eyes and then you pan the camera away and give it the sound effect, way worse than what we just saw in uh, Moonrise Kingdom. Yeah, That's we all I'm saying. We didn't, we didn't get any sounds of the dog dying. Nothing. And then, again, when we looked at it, which is funny because when the characters are told about it, they're kind of like, yeah. Yeah, and, and then that's another compelling point. So uh, right after the boys give the graphic recount to each other of, of what went down, you know, they, uh, Susie and Sam, they're, they're talking about, and Susie, she's like, was he a good dog? And what does Sam say? Who's to say? Yeah. That, but, but he didn't deserve to die. And right. I thought that was a very mature kind of thing to say. Mm-hmm. So the very next thing that happens is we have, but they're trying to get, they're trying to get Redford off the island and Mr. Mr. and Mrs. Bishop are at the dock confronting Captain Sharp and, and, and uh, and Ward and I love this scene the way that it was shot. Oh, it's beautiful and and the way that Bill Murray and Bruce Willis and all of them play it, it's so funny. Yeah, Bill Murray's like not caring about the kid who's been stabbed in the back. He just wants his daughter back. That's and- right. Well, oh fuck, I'd be the same way. But my favorite bit is when he takes off his shoe and he throws it at not Bruce Willis, but he throws it at Ward. Edward Norton. Yeah, Ward. and Sharp's like. Did you just take your shoe off? <laughs> this is good. I loved how he referred to uh, the beige lunatics. Yes. Anyway, and so then uh, immediately afterwards, they're interrupted by the narrator who believes he knows where the kids are headed to. Right. And so now that's where they're heading towards. Right. And so now we get to where they're getting to uh, their their spot. Title Inlet 3.25. That's right. What did you think about that bit of Sam painting Susie? I thought it was a bit Titanic. That's what I thought, too. That's the first thing I thought of. But what sells it and what sells Sam's character is the corn cob pipe. Totally. That's exactly what I was thinking. I kept thinking. wanting to know what he was smoking. <laughs> I thought about that for a second. Uh, 1965 kids, probably tobacco. Yeah, it probably really right. was. So, And then right after that, I made you some jewelry. And then uh, this scene killed me. Fish hooks. The fish hooks through the ear. Fish hooks. And I kept thinking, okay, well, first of all, it's going to really hurt. How, do we know if they're clean because they've used them to fish with? They went to the ears, but then you can't just pull a fish hook right out. I know. And uh, her mom even uh, kind of mentions yeah, that how later are we get on. These out of your ears? Yeah. Um, and the dead bugs on them. 
Were those real or were those just like lures? Those th- were beetles. Those I, were well, beetles. I know what they were beetles, but I want to know were they real or were they lures? Having a clue. Oh wait, I have a question. I'm with you. <laughs> <laughs> then why'd you ask? Well, because you brought it up. Immediately after this, they expressed their love towards each other, and then we have. Their first kiss. This whole scene, and again, this just goes back to maybe me having some troubles with the way that Wes Anderson presents the dialogue, is I couldn't tell for sure if, you know, I I got the feeling that they really cared about each other and really loved each other, but this whole thing of, you know, the first kiss and everything else that happens, it felt like they were just repeating what they see adults do. It's not so much that that's what they wanted to do, but that's how they saw a mature relationship. And now that they were together and off alone, this is what they were supposed to do. There just didn't seem like a lot of feeling in it. Well, I mean, how much feeling can you have at 12 years old? It's supposed to be your first big love, your first big crush, your first big teen romance kind of thing, you know, into the whole broadening of growing up and maturing. I don't know if I felt it in this scene. Like when, you know, they kiss and he turns and spits and then you want so a, you want a French kiss? Okay. I mean Were you ever twelve? I was twelve at one time. Um I thought everything that they were doing I don't know if they were just going on what they've seen. I'm sure that's some of it. But I think that with the characters and the way it kind of developed, you could get through their dialogue leading up to this scene that they did care about each other and, and they're living this this fantasy that they can just disappear and run away, which, come on, isn't realistic at all, but they're in the moment, right? And so I thought they did a fine job. And what immediately follows after this? The next scene we have immediately after this is that she is reading to him in the firelight. Yeah, mm-hmm. which I think is wonderful. It is. I thought it was very sweet. Yes. And again, the corn cob pipe. Mm. I love that kid. Totally. Yeah. It adds so much character to him to have have that pipe in his mouth so much. Yeah. And, and I love the dancing scene. And I loved uh, how he kind of just started with the music and then he got into it. And I mean, that whole scene was just fun. And now it's the next morning. Dun, dun, dun. Susie's parents, Ward, the scouts, and Sharp finally find Sam and Susie in their tent. Susie's parents take her home. Ward gives Sam a letter from the Billingsleys stating that they no longer wish to house Sam. He stays with Sharp while they await the arrival of the social services worker, who will likely place Sam in an orphanage and possibly treat him with electroshock therapy. While in their treehouse, The Camp Ivanhoe scouts have a change of heart and decide to help Sam and Susie. Together, they paddle to neighboring St. Jack Wood Island to seek out the help of Ben, an older cousin of the scout Skotak. Ben works at Fort Lebanon, a larger khaki scout summer camp on St. Jack Wood Island run by Ward Superior Commander Pierce. Ben decides to try to take Sam and Susie to a crabbing boat anchored off the island so that Sam can work as a crewman and avoid social services. He performs a wedding ceremony, which he admits is not legal binding before they leave. Sam and Susie never make it onto the crabbing boat, and her parents, Captain Sharp, social services, and the scouts from Lebanon under the command of Ward pursue them instead. A violent hurricane and flash flood strike, and Sharp apprehends Sam and Susie on the steeple of the church in which they first met. Lightning destroys the steeple, but Sharp saves them. During the storm, he decides to become Sam's legal guardian. The hurricane erases mile 3.25 title inlet from the map. At summer's end, Sam is upstairs painting a landscape of Moonrise Kingdom. Susie and her brothers are called to dinner while Sam slips out the window to join Sharp in his patrol car, telling Susie, He will see her the following day. Roll credits. So it turns out that the narrator did know where they were, and we get a shot of them in the tent sleeping, and we hear a plane uh, pass over Mm -hmm. and some boats and some rustling, and then all of a sudden the zipper snaps up, and there is everybody. Well, doesn't he actually, uh, Bill Murray's character, lift up the whole tent off of them? Eventually. Eventually, yeah. Yeah. So clearly... They're caught. I, I liked that moment when he does that because he, he comes rushing at them in a rage. He's, he's rushing towards us, the camera. And then when he picks up the tent and holds it over his head, he's like, oh, 
this is really light type of look on his face. He was right. surprised by it. He that. wasn't expecting it, yeah. So then they are taken back. And Sam is given the letter, and he's now discovered that he has no place to go. Right. Because yeah, he had kind of mentioned earlier that he liked his new foster family. Yeah, he said that they were getting along and everything mm. seemed to be going well. Uh, but he says that after we, the audience, learns that mm. we're not going to invite him back. Yeah, and it's that awkward boat ride back. Yeah. Sam's down below, and uh, Ward comes to talk to him, mm -hmm. gets to know him a little bit better, I guess. Um, and he tells him, you know, how social proud, how proud he was of of his camping skills uh, and and the camps that he he had put together. He he would give them high remarks or whatever. Well, high high com uh, commendations. High commendations. Now that's one of the reasons why I said earlier that I thought maybe he was turning out to be the best of the scouts. Even the scouts, when they talk later you know, about helping him, mention how good he did when he was out on his own. Yeah. So once we get back, then we get social services on the line, and then we start hearing about potentially all of the possible dreadful future choices that could be for Sam in an orphanage. What do you think of the decision not to give that character a name, just to call her social services? I thought it was fine. I thought it was very Wes Anderson. And then we have that very bland blue on the left, and then the sharp contrasting bright purple on the right. Right. Yeah. Very, very, very uh, prominent in a Wes Anderson movie. So social services coming the next day. Uh, what do you say? I have Jed pick you up and bring you in with the mail. I thought that was nice. And then we have a conversation that happens between Susie and her mother. Well, I think right before that, don't we see uh, Mr. Bishop downstairs with the children? He's got his shirt off and he's like kind of walking. They, they ask him like, what are you doing? And he says, I'm going to go chop something down. <laughs> I thought that was kind of a funny remark. Yeah, he, he walks out. I'm going to go find a tree to chop down. Yeah, I'm gonna go and find he's got tree. this big bottle of wine or champagne yeah, or whatever. Kind of and his shirt's weird. off. Yeah, just kind of a weird, just all of a sudden. It was, yeah, it was kind of weird. I, I liked it. I dug it. But you're right, uh, Professor. This is where we have the scene between the mother and the daughter upstairs. And this, I guess, was supposed to reveal to the audience that, you know, Susie is portrayed as a troubled youth, that she is a problem causer when really – it's what the mother's been doing that has been causing her all the trouble. I think it's been causing some trouble. I don't know if it's all of it. Do they say that it's all of it? They hint that she's very angry at her mother, that she's very upset, and that is a, one of the main reasons why she has been acting out is because she's been keeping the secret that she saw what her mother did with the uh, police officer. Um, I took it as uh, she found the pamphlet uh, long before she saw... Bruce and uh, Mrs. Bishop. The book, Dealing with the Troubled Child. Right. So I, I think I took it as when she found that, she was already on the on the outs with it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, And then she brings it up well with her mom, and her mom's like, I can't even, you know. Why is everything so hard with you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what does she respond with? We were in love. We just want to be together. How, how young lovey does that sound? And, and what's mm -hmm. wrong with that? Well. They are 12. Well, that's what she says to the mom. No. Oh. <laughs> Which is interesting because I think that's kind of what the mother is thinking too is she's given up her whole life. She's in a loveless marriage because she has all these kids. And wouldn't she love to just be able to run off with the guy that she really cares about? Yeah, it, very much so. Yeah. You know, that, that she has in a way almost died being a grown-up and a parent now. And all of those young whimsical feelings are behind her. Yeah, and well, she's bitter about it. That's what happens when you get old. I thought it was just so interesting, too, and maybe it is a Wes Anderson thing. I don't know for sure. I haven't seen enough of his movies. But the fact that it almost seems, you know, he hadn't connected all the dots, but Bill Murray's character, Mr. Bishop, knew his marriage was pretty much loveless and on the outs. And they basically, when they're in bed, you know, and they're two separate beds talking to each other, they basically mentioned that they just have to stay together for the kids. Yeah, well, they both well, they both apologize to each other. Yeah, right for whatever, and uh, they both take responsibility for it. And you know, who knows how that all works out. So the next thing that we get is now we're in Captain Sharp's trailer with Sam, and they start small talking. And I really like this bit. Uh, it and it was here where I kind of thought to myself, I wonder if it's going to be Sharp or Ward who's going to step up and uh, adopt or it, house. I was Sam, thinking. Right? I was thinking the same. He's going to end up with one of these two. Right. And so I like the conversation that they're having, and you know, 
uh, Sam's just trying to explain, you know, what they were thinking, why, why they did what they did. And it was because when they first met, something happened to them. Mm -hmm. Right. And I like the fact that Sharp is like, you know what? I don't even, I, I, I have nothing to argue that with because I mean, it is what it is. But on the other hand, I don't have to because you're fucking 12. <laughs> but what does he do right after that? Want a slug? Uh, I, yes, well, that's absolutely. What, that's what I loved about that conversation is because he wasn't speaking to Sam as, you know, an adult to a child. It was almost like they were having an adult to an adult relationship. So he offers him the beer like he would just offer it to another an adult. I, well, I kind of took it as he was just trying to be cool. Hmm. I, I don't mean, know. The, the cool he, uncle or whatever. But he gave him a second slug as well. Yeah. Yeah, which I thought was funny. And then next scene, we're up in the treehouse. <laughs> up in that treehouse, they're all there and they're all playing poker. And they got. Did I notice that the treehouse was kind of wobbling a little bit still? Uh, yeah, physics, man. Well, the storm, the, oh. the, the, the upcoming storm. This is where we get, you know, the khaki scouts coming around saying, you know what, maybe we made a mistake. Yep. Maybe we should help him out. Maybe and, we should help him be together. And maybe he's not that bad of a kid. I mean, he is an orphan and he has his issues from being an orphan. Yeah. And they recognize that. Right. You know what I mean? So they kind of give him a second chance or whatever. So, yeah, they decide you, maybe we want to help. That's right. And so they were smart and they spring the girlfriend first. Well, I loved how, how they, they're like, okay, what do you need? For starters, three yards of chicken wire, some ripped up newspapers, and a bucket of wheat paste. Yeah. I don't know if it was like a little later on. I love the fact that she took the the record player again, and this time she didn't promise to give it back because screw him. Yeah, for, absolutely. For tattling. Yeah, I know. And come on. You can't go, you can't not go anywhere without tunes, yeah. right? 1965, you had that little portable record player. I fucking yeah. loved it. Yeah. And then the next scene we have... Mr. Bishop, he's sitting outside at that mostly chopped up tree. <laughs> and then out comes Mrs. Bishop and she takes off on the bike. Yeah. And then right after she leaves, then you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight scouts come out the bottom half. And then the ninth scout, he opens up the top half and he walks out the door normally. Yeah, I saw that. I saw that. So they spring her and then they go to get him. And they're like, hey, dude, we'll, we'll get you out of here. And he's like, no, nope, I don't want to do it unless... I don't trust you. Well, and, and I don't want to go without Susie. And then she peers over, and then there's that look on his face, like, you just got so happy. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was really good. Yeah. He says, there's no point. That's right. Not without Susie. And then, bink, her head's over the top. Yep. So the plan is to get them to Fort Lebanon, to get them to talk to an older cousin of the Scout Skotak, uh, cousin Ben, which is played by Jason Schwartzman, and they the plan is to get him away from social services so he doesn't have to get electroshock therapy, but they want to put him on a crab boat so he can start working. Crabbing, yeah. And, but he doesn't want to go without his wife. Yeah. Well, he, he hasn't married her yet. I know, but he he wants to marry her. And then a, and then a nice little moment here, the, the uh, narrator, he injects about the upcoming storm and he specifically points out that it's 4 35 a.m so the the storm is becoming a more prevalent part of the story arc right right because it's going to culminate uh at the end of this night yep right so they get into the camp and they meet schwartzman's character and what do you guys think of jason schwartzman here oh he was great he's in it for like two seconds but he does such a good job yeah this cast is really strong i think this cast is great they I guess get married in no legal sense whatsoever. And um, that is one of the best interactions. I think we were talking about earlier before we start recording, Don, that you said the whole idea of, you know, that he's telling them you're entering into a serious contract. And you have to take this very serious. And do you understand this? And they're like, yes. And he's like, no, you, I don't think you're taking it seriously enough. And I want you to go over there and think about it. And, I love that. I want you to go over there and think about it and come back me and look me in the eye. And then spit out your gum. Oh, this is a serious thing. I, I don't like the attitude. Jason Schwartzman's great delivery in that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have to say that whole dialogue totally crackles. You know, I want to bring my wife, but we're not married yet. Are you his girl? Oh, what I love so much about that moment is right there at that moment when he says, I want to bring my wife. And then in the background on the platform, the rocket. Oh, right. Yeah. Right. And then, but we're not married yet. 
are you his girl? And then she says, yes. And then the rocket <laughs> hits the ground. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderfully choreographed and timed. I, I just, I thought that was so delightful. Another thing that I thought was really, really fun that happened just a little bit before is the little, the little guy, he is, where is my record player? And then it shows an exterior shot of the house and it's a big long, ah, yeah. realizing that it's gone. Yeah. I loved that moment. Oh, and then right after that, you have Scott Master Ward. He gets up in the morning. And he finds the camp is entirely imb- abandoned. You know? And it's the same motions that he had from the beginning of the film. Yes, and, exactly. But this time there's no kids there. Well, that's what I'm saying. He got, he must have gone through the whole same thing. And he didn't really notice they were all missing until he was sitting at the table. Yeah, well, yeah. I thought I thought him because he rung the bell. That was he, so funny. Yeah. Did you catch the reference right after uh, Cousin Ben marries them that he says the line, Take the carbon, leave the Bible. Did you get the movie reference in that? No. Take the... Stop it. Leave the body, take the cannoli. Exactly. Leave the gun, take the cannoli. What I which said. Was, oh, body. You said leave yeah. body, right. which was a call out to the Godfather. Yeah. So they jump in the sailboat and they, and they sail away. And they forget. And then they sail back. Because they forgot the binoculars. Uh, the binoculars. Well, well, I love this because Sam knows... That that is Susie's secret power. Yeah. That that's everything to her. Yeah. And so naturally he goes back for it. And when he goes back for it, who has it? Redford. 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 Dun, dun, dun. And so we have a uh, kind of a standoff, standoff moment here. And then Sam lands up. Uh, hitting him in his wound again. I, I, yes. lo- I love that when they start the fight, immediately Sam just starts jabbing him right in that wound. That's what I would have done. Total kneecap move. Oh, yeah. yeah, for sure. For sure. Now the camp is alerted, and now they're on the run because now they have the entire camp going after them. Well, basically Sam. I mean, everyone is just chasing after him. And I don't know if he's purposely trying to lead them away, especially when he runs into that big field, that lightning field. Yeah, there's there's a little bit of continuity there because uh, – at what point did all of his people come back to him? Because they're in the chase too somehow. But this is where he gets uh, electrocuted. Come and get me, you <laughs> bastard! Did you guys see this coming? No. Well, when they called it the lightning field, I figured something was about to happen. Oh, did you? Yeah, but but I guess, again, symbolism with Wes Anderson, lightning is a symbolism. Getting hit by lightning is a symbolism of death and rebirth. And so this was the rebirth of Sam. Yeah. Yeah. So Troop 55, they get they get Sam back, and they end up fleeing. And then right after that, it shows the dam breaking, and here comes all the rushing water. And they're, they're trying to get the camp evacuated now because now the storm has shown up. And this is where we meet Harvey Keitel's character. I totally forgot he was in this movie. Me too. And he is a ward superior. and Commander Rawhide. And, and so uh, Ward comes in. They're trying to get everybody uh, evacuated. And uh, Rawhide's like, where's your fucking troop? And he's like, "Uh, I thought they were here. (laughs) You must be the worst scout master ever. So he immediately gets stripped of all of his fucking awards. He even takes away his pocket knife. I know. What a dick, right? But karma's a bitch, right? Uh, It turns out that he needs his medicine. Or something, and he goes back into his cabin or his tent, whatever. Mm-hmm. And the the water's coming. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is another model shot. Do you guys notice that? Yeah, yeah. It looked very modelly, but it looked yeah. very Wes Anderson, so yeah. it was fine. Was it you know the I mean? fireworks that blew up the tent, or what blew up his tent that lit it on fire? Uh, the tree fell on it. Or yeah. Was- I thought it, yeah, I thought it was so, something fell on it because of the uh, storm that was coming, mm. and so. Uh, Ward goes in and saves him, thus probably earning all of his merits back. Or at least his pocket knife back. There you go. Well, you know, he was carrying him for a while after that. Yeah, and so they all take off. They're all starting to evacuate. And they head to the church for safety. Right. And at the church, this is where everybody's congregated and social services shows up. And this is where we see that uh, Sam and his posse, they made it into the church. And uh, in the bird costumes, yeah, in the bird costumes, and they're up on the perch. And uh, Sharp notices them, mm-hmm. he sees them, but he doesn't say nothing because he doesn't want to see this kid get electric shock. Well, yeah, he doesn't want to get taken by social services, right? So, yeah, so they flee and they go up to the church steeple 
and uh, this is where you know Susie and Sa- Susie's like, let's jump. We we got to jump. The water's down there, and this is that one of those moments where Sam has grown up a little bit more because he doesn't have his life jacket, but he trusts Susie and he loves her, and so he's gonna jump. And one of the things I appreciated with their conversation, and it's kind of a scary thing to hear kids say, is if this happens to be a suicide moment, thank you for marrying me. I, I mean, thought, they, they knew that death was on the line here. Yeah, absolutely. I, th- I thought that was a sweet, tender moment. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I also really appreciated this scene in that everything that we've been hinted at and kind of given information along the way all comes to a boil at this scene. We figure out why we had to have the bishops be lawyers. We figure out, you know, which one of them is going to adopt the child. You know, we have social services there. I mean, social services says you can't adopt the child. Well, we got two lawyers here that say, yes, he can. Right. And, and I, and I'll just be honest with you guys. The moment he says, uh, so what do you think, pal? Fucking cried like a baby. So it was dope. I liked it. Mm Mm-hmm. Good on you, Bruce. Good on you. Sam agrees, and then... We think the worst has happened. But there's a very... Uh, there's a Batman 89 moment there. Uh, where I love They're that. all holding each other. That silhouette of them holding each other. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't let go! Yeah. Uh, Titanic, anyone? Mm-hmm. But yeah, totally reminded me of Batman. Next shot is we have the narrator standing at the exterior with the steeple on the crushed Volkswagen. And kind of telling us uh, the aftermath of the hurricane and now 3.25 tidal, tidal, island, tidal inlet, uh, tidal inlet is, uh, was w- washed off the map. Do you want to know another goof in this movie? Nope, but go ahead. Professor, did you want to know another goof in this movie? Uh, okay. The steeple crushed the Volkswagen bug. What was wrong with that scene? It wasn't crushed enough. What year was this movie supposed to be taking place? 1965. Apparently, that was a 1969 Volkswagen bug. Ho, 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 ho. Zero fucks. That's it. That's what I figured. Fucking dumb. We're done. Good night. Okay, but how about just... So, for me, I, I had a little thing that I noticed, but it's not a big deal. When the, when they're on the... When, uh, when Sharp is on the radio in the beginning and they keep saying, you know, they're talking and they say over, do you understand why you say over? So do you know that you're done talking? Right, because if both of us have our buttons pushed in at the same time talking, we won't know that the other person can't hear us. And so the person on the other line is always supposed to end with over. It's a really awkward thing that can happen if you're not used to it because if you're talking to somebody and you're done talking, over, <laughs> right? You have this big, long gap. So you always, so since they are so condition for that they know how to work it why the hell does ward say over and out because you see you either say over or you say out and then when you say out you are officially ending over and out is a very common phrase i know but it it is a common phrase but anybody who talks on a radio they don't go together because they are two very different things Mm. over and out fuck off and then we find out you know it's about a month later yeah and this bit was this bit was adorable to me. Again, we're in the dollhouse, and we're listening to the record player and Sam's uh, painting, and Susie's on the windowsill reading, and it's time for dinner. And the two brothers were even there, so it shows that they kind of accepted everything. Yeah, sure. I mean, time goes on, right? Everyone needs to grow up. <clears throat> and uh, we see Sam, but he has to leave through the window. Did you catch, too, that he's no longer in his khaki uniform? I'm going to go ahead and say, thank you, Captain Obvious. Yes, we noticed his fucking uniform changed, and it looks just, he had the same uniform as fucking uh, Sharp. So fucking adorable. Adorable. I, I loved it because you, he's going to be okay. He's, I took it as he's going to be okay. He's got a good role model. You know, everything's going to be all right. Scoutmaster Ward, he also had a new recruit. I felt like that he was taking the place of Sam. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. Did you catch the uh, in the Scoutmaster scene? I guess I didn't see this, but I was reading about it. In the beginning of the movie, uh, next to his tape recorder is a framed picture of Commander Pierce. But at the end of the movie, that picture has changed. Have you know? Did you notice the change in the picture? I think I did at the moment that I I, I recognized that it was a, something different. It became Becky, the switchboard operator. So this That's is supposed right. to show to us. That's right. That. I remember that. You know, he's maybe now in a new relationship himself. All right. There you go. Good job, Ward. 
what do you think of their interaction, Sam and Susie, as you know he's climbing out the window and see you tomorrow? Oh, it, it was it was a great ending. Very sweet. Yeah, you know, because that's that's what their life is going to consist of for a while, mm-hmm. and that's okay. That's that's good living right there. I remember being twelve. I remember being head over heels, and yeah, good time in your life, and that's fucking Moonrise Kingdom. So throughout this whole movie, especially in the earlier stages, it seems like there was a lot of walking, a lot of hiking, and just the two of them going along these trails and paths and climbing the hills. What does that remind you Wait of? Oh, for fuck's Stop sakes. It. And now it's time for John's... Moment. So this is the point in our podcast where I take whatever movie we're currently reviewing and compare it to the greatest movie series ever made, Lord of the Rings. So for Moonrise Kingdom, I'm going to start with Sam and Susie. Both are characters on a journey. Just like Frodo and Sam grow over the time during their journey, so do Sam and Susie. So essentially, I'm going to say both of them are Frodo and Sam, depending whose journey you're focusing on. Both show qualities, you know, the same type of qualities, determination, loyalty, overcoming fear, and so on. Captain Sharp is my pick for Aragorn. For most of the Lord of the Rings, it's Aragorn who is trailing Frodo and Sam all the while wanting to make sure they are safe. And at the end, much like Aragorn, it's through Sharp's actions like Aragorn, Aragorn's diversion at the gates of Mordor that helped keep them both alive. I'd say he helped them complete their journey, but really, their journey is ongoing. Scoutmaster Ward shows a lot of Gandalf qualities. He's wise, he's willing to lead, but like Gandalf, not everyone is willing to heed his wisdom. Mr. Bishop shares qualities of Denthor II. He tries to keep rule over his kingdom that is currently crumbling all around him. And he dislikes his biggest threat to his rule, Aragorn, in the form of Captain Sharp. Cousin Ben gives me an Elrond-type vibe. He seemed to both support and not support the journey of Sam and Susie. And like Elrond, he gives the impression that he's not always thinking that these folks are taking the matter seriously enough. For the first two acts of this movie, I would say that the khaki scouts are reminiscent of the Ringwraiths as they pursue Sam and Susie. It's when they choose to help Sam and Susie later on that I feel like then they become members of the Fellowship, all except Redford. Redford, the scout who got stabbed and remains Sam's enemy, came off as a Sauron the White. He continues to follow orders and is just being a jerk. So who is the big bad in the movie? The evil eye that watches and sees everything. My pick for Sauron is social services. In the guise of what's best for Sam, as in best for Middle Earth, it's social services that has plans to ruin his whole world. Notice how social services just seems to know everything going on without actually being there. It's like she sees everything. So what is the precious? What is the one ring In Moonrise Kingdom, the ring is represented by the barriers that society puts on us, telling us who we are and who we are meant to be. Sam is seen as an emotionally disturbed orphan. He longs for connection, for the family that he lacks, to be part of a group, but really he's held hostage and separated from the group from everything that he wants. For Susie, she's seen as a very troubled child who just wants to be free to be herself to be accepted as a different from everyone else around her. Her troubles stem from her mother's actions. Unknown to others, it's not until she's with Sam that she's able to become who she wishes to be. For much of their journey, it almost feels like they're going through the motions of what they feel an adult relationship should look like. But as their bonds grow, especially at the church spire scene during the storm, they become who they are meant to be, beyond caring what society thinks, that's when they cast off their ring into Mount Doom and free themselves. And there you have it, my comparison between Moonrise Kingdom and Lord of the Rings. Bring on the grades. 
What you got? Fine. (laughs) Fine. Well, Frodo and Sam are obvious. And I... I think I appreciate the uh, the Sauron angle for social services. I thought that was good too, and I can see how the uh, the khaki troops can be like the Fellowship. You know, they're all banding together to help uh, Sam and Susie. Outside of that, I I I didn't have as strong of a feeling, so I'm going to go ahead and give this a solid C plus. C plus for the comic book guy. <clears throat> um, I like the bit where you have the Denethal and Aragorn. Aragorn conflict. That was a good parallel. Uh, the social services, good parallel, because I like that, how she sees all. That was a nice touch. I'm going to give you a C. Thank you. I, one of the, and not to lose my grade, one of the reasons why I felt like, did you notice that social services seemed to know when the kids were missing again, yet no one seemed to have told her? Yeah. That's why I kind of thought, so how is she knowing this? How is she seeing this? I also, I personally liked my idea of, during that pursuit, when the scout the khaki scouts are pursuing them at first, they kind of felt like the ring race. At first, yeah, because they have that moment where they face off and they're the enemies, but then they flip mm-hmm. it and make they become allies. Mm-hmm. Not that the ring race do that, but I, I see what you're going there. The only person I struggled with who to place of the people that I wanted to place was Mrs. Billingsley, or not Mrs. Billingsley, um, Bishop. Mrs. Bishop. Who would you have placed, Miss Mrs. Bishop? C minus. <laughs> Because you went too far. You don't have an idea of who you would put her as? D plus. Okay. I'm, 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 I'm going to keep dropping it until we're done. I also couldn't think of a golem, but I didn't think this one needed a golem. No, it didn't need a golem. Uh, Mrs. Bishop? Um, Gladriel. Damn. Nailed it. Yeah, but she doesn't get with Denthor. And that was John's. Precious. Moment. All right, what do you guys think? You guys ready to rate this flick? I'm ready to rate this flick. John, are you ready to rate this flick? Let's rate this flick. Uh, Professor, how do we do our ratings? We do our ratings on a scale of one to five fucks. Five fucks is a movie that we think is cinematic gold. If somebody says, hey, you want to watch Moonrise Kingdom? Fuck yeah, I do. That's a fucking awesome movie. A one fuck movie is a, what the fuck was that? And what's a zero? A zero fuck movie. Oh, for shit's sake. What the hell? This movie is this movie isn't even worth a fuck. I want one hour and thirty four minutes of my life back. Or in other words, we just don't give a fuck. All right, who wants to go first? I'll go first. All right, hit us. You know, I have to say it had been several years since I'd seen this movie, and I think that it was a very rich experience compared to what I recalled from seeing the movie the last time around. Wes Anderson has a very definite style that is so intoxicating to watch. The way that he moves the camera, the way he presents his sets, and having these uh, sets in conjunction with the writing that was put together for this, I think is just beautiful. It is such a stylish look and so distinctive, and it is captivating to watch. And it was a very fun entertaining movie to watch these two characters go on their little journey together and it is such a sweet and tender story between these two it is so enchanting to watch them as they go about their little adventure together the supporting cast that we have in bruce willis and bill murray and francis mcdormand and edward norton delightful they are such wonderful restrained characters playing their roles and I just loved any time any of these characters were on the screen because they were presented so interestingly I thought that the movie was just the right you know it you know at at an hour and a half really really tight story and I thought that it moved very well and I am eager and happy to watch this movie again anytime soon I'm going to give this a solid 4.25 fucks 4.25 4.25 fucks from the professor. I'll go next. Unless you wanted to go next. No, I'll save mine for last. Okay. All right. Uh, Moonrise Kingdom. I like Wes Anderson as a director. I like Wes Anderson as a storyteller and a writer. I think that his movies have style, and I think that they are witty and clever and snappy, as you were saying, Professor. I think the soundtrack for this film fit like a glove I think this cast was spot on 
and everything that needed to come together to make this film happen did. And, you know, it shows on screen and it, it was captivating and very well written. I, I was, I'm a big fan of Moonrise Kingdom. This is probably my third time seeing it. And I have to say that I like it more and more as I watch it. So will I watch Moonrise Kingdom again? Fuck yeah, I will. Um, is it a perfect movie? No. Is it my favorite Wes Anderson movie? No. I am pretty adamant about Fantastic Mr. Fox being my favorite Wes Anderson movie, and I'm looking forward to us uh, talking about it one day. But I did like Budapest. Uh, I did like the ones that came after and before. But this definitely is probably in my top three of Wes Anderson films. I'm glad that we reviewed this movie. I'm glad we got to talk about it. I'm giving Moonrise Kingdom 4.25 fucks. All right, comic book guy. Typically, I'm not a fan of Wes Anderson movies. I think I have made that apparent. Although, really, it's hard to say that because this is only the second one I've seen. From the start of the movie, I felt like we were watching a painting be made due to the styling and the colors. The, the dialogue felt a lot like brush strokes. And in some ways, the tone was like watching paint dry. I will say, moving past the non-emotionally delivered dialect of Moonrise Kingdom, I do appreciate the story and the obvious symbolism throughout the movie. I'm actually a really big fan of symbolism in movies and you know, finding them and spotting them and understanding where the director was going with it. What I took from this movie is that it's about finding your place and growing beyond your set boundaries mainly kind of being like reborn into the next phase of your life. On the surface, Moonrise Kingdom appears to be just about relationships. The new relationship between Susie and Sam, the crumbling relationship between the bishops, the scandalous relationship between Mrs. Bishop and Captain Sharp, the relationship between the Scoutmaster, I guess, and all the khaki scouts, and everything else going on. But as the movie progresses, you start to see it rise beyond relationships and dwell into breaking out of defined roles. Susie is defined as a very troubled child. With Sam, and through his eyes, she is able to, to become more of a free spirit, a nonconformist, and a storyteller. Sam, in the beginning, is defined as emotionally disturbed. He's an orphan who just wants to belong, wants a family, and is a conformist. So he throws himself into the khaki scouts, while at the same time unavoidably standing out. As the movie goes on, he is able to shed some of his conformist ways, including his uniform, and be okay with standing out. He even has a ritualistic rebirth with a lightning strike scene. This movie did have me struggling at certain points of whether or not I would support two kids running off together, or where I'd be more on the parent side of being upset that the two kids would run off together. But then you have to remember this is a fantasy. This is, you know, how children would see themselves running off and, you know, having their first love, everything like that. And so I appreciate the movie for what it is. The pacing was good. All the side stories felt necessary. The soundtrack worked amazingly with the overall design. And it's for that reason that I'm giving Moonrise Kingdom 3.25 fucks. 3.25 fucks from the comic book guy, 4.25 fucks from the professor, and 4.25 fucks from yours truly gives Moonrise Kingdom an average of 3.9 fucks. And with 3.9 fucks, it now ties the Suicide Squad with the 12 position which means it is slightly better than True Lies, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, Rambo First Blood Part 2, Black Panther Wakanda Forever, and slightly worse than The Batman, Clerks 2, Edge of Tomorrow, and Violent Night. So there you go. 3.9. You know, I will say that for all the flack that I give Wes Anderson, I would watch this movie again. <laughs> Leaps and bounds, baby. He's growing by leaps and bounds. Look at that. It's a very sweet story. Mm -hmm. All right. That is going to wrap it up for this episode. If you would like to know which movie we are going to review next, please check out our website 
And speaking of which, John, where can they find us? Well, as always, they can find us at our website, threeguysinaflick.com, where we post all of our podcasts, our show notes, movie trivia, really anything else I feel like putting up on our site. You can find us at any of the social media sites or any uh, podcast directory. All right. I just want to thank Zach, Ronnie, and Jill for always listening. Keep on listening. Thanks, Zach. Thanks, Ronnie. Thanks, Jill. Thanks to Gabe for throwing it into the helmet and making us watch it. We had a really good time. And I want to thank everyone who listens and who has suggested a movie. Be sure to pass us along to a friend. And if you keep listening to them, we'll keep recording them. So for Three Guys in a Flick, I'm Don. I'm John. And I'm Ken. Thanks for listening. I think, he has some, I think he has something up his sleeve. I'm just feeling inspired by Wes Anderson. Wow, that is that is such a uh, shock because I'm just going to remind the listeners real quick, the last Wes Anderson movie we did was The Life Aquatic, and you gave it a whopping 1.5 fucks. So no, that was me. He gave it the 1.5. You I, gave it the 1.5? Yes, sir. Well, that's what I get for not reading the fucking website. I didn't mean, like, say anything. What's that? That, Say anything. That's a coming of age that's a, movie. That's a coming of age movie as well. Oh yeah, there it is. Coming of age and going to jail, but yeah, he didn't go to jail. Well, we uh, didn't get the rest I just of it. I just watched uh, Dahmer on Netflix. That's so. Say anything reminded you of Dahmer? No, it reminded me of you. So, um, well, I am hungry. That's what I'm gonna say from now on. Over and out. Oh, but you know, I guess you could do that if you're on a radio. You could go over out. Ha 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 ha. Or I could just say over and out. But that's not what they say. That's what I say. I don't give a fuck what anybody says. You should know that about me by now. <clears throat> and uh, we see Sam, but he has to leave through the window. Did you catch, too, that he's no longer in his khaki uniform? Oh, Hunter. I almost fucking said it. Oh, and it was going to be the first of the show. C plus from the comic book guy. Uh, I like the For bit. For the comic book guy. What did I say? From. I don't give a fuck. Fuck you. I enjoyed it. I really did. Well, that's why you gave it 4.25 fucks. Thanks, buddy. Thanks, Captain Obvious. I, porn name? I was trying to think I knew something. you guys were going to go there. Of course we were. Uh, I got one. Hard on Kingdom? No. No, that's just... Too easy. Moonrise Kingdom. There you go. Mic drop. Professor? <laughs> Can bring, bring a whole new meaning to that beach sequence. Uh, whoa, 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 dude. They would be adults Stop in your movie. it. Stop it. Fuck off, good night.